Jesus always did the Father's will, showed him what to do. Jesus always did the Father's works, showed him how to do the works, and Jesus always spoke the Father's words, and that showed him what to say. Pretty simple, but... And that, again, was John's revelation. Uh, Cindy came to me and just uh, asked a question. She said, it may be good to make this a little more clear, and that is, our power to forgive sins has nothing to do with what happens in heaven. We have no power to re release people from their sins before the throne room of God. Only Jesus can do that. This is an earth thing that happens. We have the power down here. By the way, you can keep people bound in their sin even after they're a Christian. But by constantly condemning them. You ever notice that? It brings death on them. So we have that authority. We, and clearly in John chapter 20, verses 21 and 22, Whosoever sins you remit shall be remitted. Whosoever sins you forgive shall be forgiven. There is a power in forgiveness. That is totally awesome. The power of forgiveness releases people. Not just in heaven, but on earth. Okay, now we're on verse, or page 29. Okay, we're going to have to move quickly through this. And boy, this is a powerful teaching. Once you understand the anointing that Jesus had and how he functioned under the Father's authority, you are ready to seriously look at the pattern of Jesus' ministry. Understanding how Jesus ministered is the key to power. The four Gospels clearly outline what Jesus did. He used a threefold ministry. He preached the gospel of the kingdom, he cast out demons, and he healed the sick. We will look closely at these three aspects of Jesus' work. And by the way, this is going to really help you. Our years of ministry on the streets and all these years in evangelism, God began to reveal to us the best way to do these three things, particularly cast out demons and heal the sick. And there's a style that God has given us that is so effective and it really works. We were taking our video cameras down to the streets of San Francisco all the time from Channel 42 and we watched the video and, and we really learned this by going back over our video and seeing what we were doing under the leading of the Holy Spirit. It was not an idea we came up with. It was witnessing of what God was actually showing us to do when we were ministering right on the streets with the people. And it began to take on a pattern. And I said, wow, how come every time we do this, people are healed? And how come when we don't do it, they're not healed? How come when we do this certain thing, people are delivered from demons? And when we don't do it, they're not. So God gave us some teaching on this. And I'm going to be sharing that in this section. So this is going to really, really help you. First, Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying what? Repent, Repent and believe. believe in the gospel. Now, unfortunately, most evangelism today only deals with the last part of that gospel. Faith. What you need to do is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But that's not the way Jesus did it. Jesus always took them through repentance first. And the church, by and large, has never been taught on how to lead people through repentance. We know well, most of you here probably know how to lead people through faith in Christ. Whatever style you use, a Romans road or whatever, and I, they're all good. But we've never been taught how to get people through repentance. And I'm going to teach you this morning. Oh, you're going to like this. After Jesus received his anointing, he immediately stood up in the temple and read from the prophet Isaiah, The Spirit of the Lord is now upon me, for he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. The kingdom of God has two elements. First is repentance. Jesus had a particular way of bringing people to repentance. Here's the style that Jesus used. Now again, we're looking to Jesus as our pattern of the evangelist. I'm going to follow Jesus' pattern. I don't know about you, but looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. I believe Jesus is the standard, nothing else. Here's how Jesus brought people to repentance. He always made them face the strong man over their life. Because when you repent of the strong man, you repent of the whole. Let me illustrate. The rich young ruler came to Jesus. He said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Ask the right question. Mm -hmm. 
Jesus said this. Wow. Was his answer different? Go sell all that you have and give it to the poor. Now, what if Bill Gates came forward in your Sunday morning service of your church? <coughs> and already you're calculating what a tithe might be from Microsoft. <laughs> Certainly would pay off our building. And the pastor gets up and Bill Gates walks forward and said, Pastor, here's my hand. I want to receive Jesus Christ today as my Savior. I doubt if many pastors in America would do what Jesus did, would do. Well, Bill, I'd like you to receive Jesus today, but I'm sorry I can't lead you to Christ right now. But if you'll go home today and sell everything you've got and come back next Sunday and tell me everything you've got now is given away to the poor, then I'll, 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 I'll win you to the kingdom. Now, what's the point here? Jesus was not asking the rich man to get rid of all of his wealth. What was he doing? He was mating, making the rich man realize the strong man over his life. Because in kingdom, you can't have two masters. So we began practicing this principle on the streets. I began teaching it. I said, is this really going to work? How do we get people to recognize the strong man over their life? What are some ways we might do that? Talking. Ask them. Here's how I ask people. I'm talking to somebody, I'm evangelizing them, and I say, can I ask you a question? Most people love them, you know, they, they want to talk, and so, yeah, yeah. What has been the main thing in your life that's kept you from Jesus? Simple question. What's been the main thing in your life that's, that's kept you from Jesus? receiving Christ. Now, when they give an answer, remember the man from Salem, Oregon that I talked about? His issue was not alcohol. It was what? Pride. The strong man over his life was pride. When pride was broken, he quit drinking. Maybe he drank because he was embarrassed. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe he'd done something wrong in his life and he couldn't face it. And he was too proud to face it, so he just drank to cover up the, the pain. But it, the issue of his life was really pride. So when people give you the answer, now you must discern if it's true or not. I, I was uh, in Stockton, California. We were doing an outreach on the streets there, and I taught this. And a lady actually was brought to me by one of the workers. And the worker said, you know what? I, I was talking to this lady, and I, I did what you said in the class, and, and she really got upset with me. And I said, well, what would you do? Well, I told the lady, what, what's the main thing in your life that, that's kept you from God? And she said, well, it's my cigarettes. Now, you know, you can smoke and go to heaven. In fact, statistics say you will get there sooner. So, I mean, smoking isn't going to keep you out of heaven. I mean, that, overeating can be just as big a sin. You know what I mean? But this gal, man, she's standing with her cigarette, and she said, I won't quit smoking for you, God, or anybody else. See, now she's standing with this Christian worker, and so I thought we'd come to an impasse with her. And I said, well, ma'am, I said, I'd like to lead you to Jesus today with this worker, but you know what? You're not ready. Well, she says, well, you know, and she walks off. About 20 minutes later, lo and behold, she comes back with her pack of cigarettes all bent up, twisted up, and she hands them to me. She says, I'm ready. <laughs> I said, now, can I ask you a question? What has been the main stronghold over your life? She said, it's not smoking. She said, it's rebellion. She said, from the time I was a child, my mom said, you are the most rebellious child that I've ever seen. You know, that, and her thing was expressed in rebellion. But she said, you know what? I'm ready to come under, as she tells me, I'm ready to come under the rulership of Jesus. Today. I, she said, I need to get my life straightened out with God. So we hit the cement, and her little five-year-old boy knelt next to her. And we led her to Jesus. And then the little boy said, I want Jesus too. So we led him to Jesus. And there was water in the park. Anytime there's a fountain in the park and there's water or a lake or whatever, we baptize. We have a lot of home we give, uh, clothes we give out to homeless. 
And we baptized so many times on the streets. It's, it's great to do this. We did a march in, in, in San Francisco with about 300 believers down Market Street, uh, just a special march. We had banners and all kinds of stuff. And 14 people received Christ during that march. And we got to the, the uh, right below the civic office of the mayor right there, and there's, there's some tearing fountains, and we just did a baptismal service right there. I believe in baptizing right there on the streets. We baptized many, many people right on the streets. We baptized the other day down at the homeless outreach, didn't we? we took, he took two pill, uh, things of water, old sock, and just pouring them right down on the head of this guy. And man, that guy got up speaking in tongues. <laughs> <laughs> he got hit by the power of God, man. He was, whoo, he was blasted by God, I'm telling you. So, repentance works. It really works. And so try this in your personal witnessing. Ask people. And by the way, people will reveal their strong man over their life if you talk to them a while. It'll come out of their lips. And God will show you what the strong man is. So Jesus, one half of the gospel of the kingdom is repentance, the other half is faith. So what we've done is fill our churches today with people that have received Jesus Christ but haven't truly repented. And that's why the church is powerless. Does that make sense? They want to still run their own business. They still want to own their own car and house and life and take Jesus along as a partner. It doesn't work that way. Don't turn there, but Luke 14, Jesus said three times, if any man has a greater love for his mother, father, wife, children, or his own life, he cannot be my disciple. See, the first thing that Discipleship costs us your affections. Because what is closer to our heart than our mother, father, wife, children, and our own life? He says, if you love any of those more than me, you are not my disciple. And then he goes on and said, Who's not willing, whoever's not willing to take up his cross daily and follow me cannot be my disciple. Three times Jesus said in this chapter, you cannot be my disciple. I mean, I don't like negative messages, you know what I mean? I wish this was easier, you know. Why didn't Jesus just preach a positive message that you're okay? <laughs> you can build a big church today on that message. <laughs> and then the third thing he said, whosoever is not willing to give up all that he possesses, verse 33 of Luke 14. The other two verses are 27 and 28, by the way. Whosoever is not willing to give up all that he possesses, not 10%. Are you, aren't you glad that Jesus didn't die 10%? I'm glad he didn't tie this blood and he just say, I'll take away 10% of your sins. We'll just make a deal. You give 10% back to me and I'll, I'll take away 10% of your sins. He said, all of your possessions. I don't own anything. I don't want to. When my car breaks down, I said, Jesus... Your car just broke down. <laughs> Jesus, my roof is leaking. No, no, your roof is leaking. <laughs> I want to be detached from this world. Amen? Let Jesus own it all. Let him run your bank account. When you come to church Sunday morning, if he says give a certain amount, some of the most thrilling times that we've had at Countryside is when my wife and I get exactly the same dollar amount that we're supposed to give to the building program or the missions. I'll say, honey, what are you doing? She says, you're writing it out exactly the, the, the amount that God said we're to give. You ever get that? When you're flowing in the Spirit together and God just shows you the same amount to give? That, that hasn't happened a lot, but when it happens, you say, wow, I know that's God. My bank account is not mine. Thank God. It's the Lord's. Everything we have is God's, starting with our body. So this is kingdom. This is kingdom. Second, Jesus cast out demons. Now we're going to get into this. Then Jesus healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he did not allow the demons to speak, for they knew him. He was preaching in their synagogue throughout all of Galilee, casting out the demons. Boy, I sure like that verse, don't I? I could name the churches that I know in Tampa Bay that practice deliverance ministries. 
on these two hands. One third of Jesus' ministry was casting out demons. Why aren't we doing it? Well, we found a better way. Listen, you cannot help some people without deliverance. And I believe in it with all my heart. I've seen the results of it. We try to counsel people out of their problems. Again, let's go back and review what I said last night and the night before. The first point of deliverance, there are two things that are vital with deliverance. Number one is true repentance. True repentance closes the door to Satan. Now, let me tell you something about demons. Demons operate by legal rights. There are laws in the kingdom under which demons operate. They know their rights. They know their limitations. They know when they lose their legal right in your life. They know that. They don't want you to know that, but they know that. This is one of the most neglected ministries, page 30, of the church today. We have rather gone to a more positive message of only preaching about things that make people feel good. So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up to thrust him out of the city. And they led him to the brow of the city on the hill which was built that they might throw him down over the cliff. See, that's... <laughs> Jesus didn't mind stirring the waters. Amen. <laughs> but he always would get to the root issues. Imagine your first message. You just graduated from seminary which was the wilderness for Jesus. He just came out of the seminary in the power of the Spirit. He gets up, and this is the first time now he's preaching in the synagogue. And at the end of his first message, I'm sure his mother was standing off the side there. What mother wouldn't want to be there when her son preached his first message? And she's saying, yeah, go, Jesus, you know. Because I don't think, is this true that the women weren't allowed in the... Well, I don't know about... The, I'm not that familiar with the Old Testament synagogue, but were they allowed, the women? I don't think they were. Yeah, they'd sit on the side, exactly. So Jesus preached. He just got up, and all he did was quote Isaiah 61. That's all he did. And then he said, this day has this scripture been fulfilled in your eyes. And it says they, tried, they went forward and, 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 and started taking him to the edge of the city, and they're going to throw him off a cliff. Now, that, I wouldn't say that's a real successful ministry start. <laughs> I remember my first message when I... Just got ordained, uh, you know, wow. My family was there to support me. I felt so good. Everybody patted me on the back. Wasn't like Jesus. He was passionate about setting people free. He didn't care what people thought. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing what? Good and healing all that were Oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. The Father was with him. Jesus didn't heal all sick people, but Jesus did set everybody free from demons that he came in contact with. He hated demons. He was passionate about taking people from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. He came to destroy the works of the devil. He didn't like what was happening in people's lives when they were under the oppression of Satan. Ooh, and that should stir you up as well. When you see your neighbor start going downhill and getting on drugs or whatever, getting into something, and it should upset us. We should start doing warfare and spiritual battle over this. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Top of 31. Now we see several truths about the devil's control over believers. I meant to quote that verse because this is really an important verse. This answers the question whether demons can influence Christians. There's a lot of debate about that. And I don't want to get into a debate with anybody about whether demons possess us as Christians or indwell our bodies. My personal interpretation of Scripture is demons cannot possess your spirit. They can indwell your body as believers. And they certainly can influence you. Let's read it. Now, this is Paul's writing to Timothy. 
And the servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient in humility, correcting those who are what? In opposition. What does it mean to be in opposition? These are believers. These are Timothy's believers in his church. If God perhaps will grant them what? Repentance. So that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and what? Escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by Satan to do his will. Wow. Written to Christians, not to the unsaved. This is Paul writing to young Timothy, instructing him on demon-influenced people in his church. Again, repentance closes the door. See what it says? When they repent, they will escape the snare of the devil. You don't think Satan has a will for your life like Jesus does? It says right here, he's got a will for you just like God has a will for you. And his will is not going to be good. <laughs> we see several things here about the devil's control over believers. First, they are in opposition to themselves. Confusion. God is not what? Author of confusion. They become opposed to themselves. They have a double mind. A double-minded man is unstable in what? All of his ways. Second, we can see the way of escape is through genuine repentance, as we've said. Repentance closes the door to demons. Demons and Satan operate on spiritual, legal rights. Legal rights. They sit and wait and watch the life of the believer and wait for a place that they might be given and that is why the Word of God says, give no place to the devil. We covered a little of this last night. Thus we see the very first principle in which demons operate, they are territorial. Demons always want a way to manifest their presence on earth. The best way they can do that is through people. But if they can't handle people, they'll even go into animals such as swine. They begged. They said, don't disembody us. Don't disembody us. Don't cast us to the way places. Jesus, put us in the swine over there. So demons are first territorial. If demons are territorial, how then do we get them out of the territory? That's the question. By bringing... the person under the rulership of Jesus. By bringing them under the authority of Jesus Christ. By submitting them. Let me give you exactly what that blank should say. By submission and bringing that area under the absolute authority of God's kingdom. Whatever is under the kingdom of God's power cannot be possessed by demons, which is another reason for complete abandonment to God's rulership over us. The second principle on which Jesus operated through uh, was through commands. You never play mental games with demons. You don't think them out. I never hear one time where Jesus did anything but command demons. So here's the way we're going to do this. As we cast demons out of people, here's the two things you do. It, this is so simple. Well, I wish somebody had taught me this years ago in deliverance. It would have saved me a lot of heartache because I made a lot of mistakes. The key to removing demons' legal rights to be in people's bodies is, number one, bringing the territory of that body under the rulership of Jesus Christ through repentance and confession and submission. Take away the legal right that those demons have to be in that body. So here's what I do. Let me illustrate. We are on the streets of San Francisco at Haight-Ashbury. We had gotten a permission, permit to shut off the streets on Haight-Ashbury, a whole block. And God really gave us favor with the city of San Francisco the, the seven years we were there. And we get these permits all the time. Well, they were giving us a hard time for a while, and so we got an attorney to write a letter to the city council that we were going to shut down the gay parade the next year. So we threatened to do. We said, we're going to raise up a community group that's going to shut down the gay parade in San Francisco. If they have a right to hit the streets, we have a right. So after that, we never had a problem getting a permit. <laughs> we just had an attorney send a letter. 
So we had this street closing, and this band from Vallejo, California came over, a black church, and I mean, these guys rocked. And you know the name of the group that came over was Deliverance? Ron Cooley and Deliverance. That was the name of the band. And so they set up their equipment right in the middle of the street, and we're going to have a, a time there. And, and this young man comes walking across, and by the way, you could see right from the street, you could see uh, demonic paraphernalia in, in, in the windows. This was a really heavy witchcraft area. And it was the area, by the way, in the, remember the hippie movement, Haight-Ashbury? And, and so this young man's coming across, you know, and we're almost ready to start, start the ministry of, of worship with Ron Cooley and Deliverance. He says, what's going on here? I said, well, I said, we're having a band play. He said, well, is it rock? I said, yeah, in fact, it is the rock. Uh, he said, The Rock. He said, I, I, are they a local band? I said, yeah, he hangs around the city a lot. But I said, it's just a one-man band. <laughs> he said, well, who is it? Do you have a name with, with The Rock? I said, it's Jesus Christ. Oh, wow. He said, that's heavy. I said, yeah, it's heavy rock. <laughs> just kind of bandering back and forth a little bit. I said, seriously, we're, we're here to lift up Jesus Christ. And then the Lord gave me a word of knowledge. I said, you're into witchcraft. Ooh, he said, how'd you know that? I said, God just showed me. You're into witchcraft. I said, you've given yourself over to Satan. He said, you know what? I have been thinking more lately about committing suicide. He said, you know the Golden Gate Bridge? I want to jump off of it all the time. He says, can you help me? I said, no, I really can't. But I know the rock. <laughs> he can. I said, if we'll, if we'll, I said, here's what you need to do. I said, if you really want to get set free from these demons that you have in your body that are talking to you about killing yourself, he says, I am constantly oppressed. He said, I'm always under this oppression in my life. I said, it's the demons in you. I said, you want to get rid of them? He said, yes, I do. I said, well, what you have to do first is you've got to submit yourself to the rulership of Jesus Christ. I said, if you want to do that, I will kneel with you right here on the cement of this street. So I said, Ron... Bring your band over here. I said, don't play yet. Let's pray with this man. So we knelt around this guy on the, at Haight-Ashbury, and we started praying. And he really repented he, with tears. He really, he said, I want to receive you, Jesus. Come into my heart. I mean, he was a classic salvation, man. He just did everything we asked him. And then I said, now listen, you just accepted Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit has come into your body. I said, I'm going to show you now how to get rid of the demons. You're going to command them to leave. We're going to help you. Here's what you say to these demons. You have no legal right to stay in my body. Get out in the name of Jesus. So he said, okay. He did it with authority, you know. You have no legal right to stay in my body, demons. I command you to come out in the name of Jesus. When he did that, you know, we're all kneeling on the cement, man. This guy jumps straight up in the air. And I mean, the blood veins in his neck are popping out. And this scream comes out of him. You can hear two blocks. He announced our meeting, man. I tell you, you could hear it two blocks away. And then he stood there and said, whoa. He was kind of a hippie type, you know. Everything was, whoa, you know. Whoa. He said, wow. So now we're all standing around him. I said, what happened? He said, yeah, I don't know, but he says, I feel free. He said, man, I am free. He starts to smile. Well, I, I check around with him while Ron Cooley and the band played that night. And the whole night he's standing there with his hands raised with a big smile. I come around and he says, oh, man, I'm enjoying my freedom. He says, I am enjoying my freedom. Every time I go around, I say the same thing. I'm enjoying my freedom. <laughs> See, we practice the things that we had learned on the streets there. Remove the territory and command the demons. And they will come out. But if people are not willing to remove the territory from Satan's control, don't deal any further with them. We had one lady that come down to our outreach and she'd stick her tongue out like a snake and walk around and she was, a, she was so demon-possessed. So one day I just got sick of it. She was always trying to disrupt and it seemed like every time we give an invitation she'd really start manifesting. So I asked everybody down there, I said, let's stop this thing, let's gather around this lady. And this was early on in our ministry and I learned that I, it didn't work. Now, the demons came out of her on our command, and boy, did she get upset. <laughs> you took away my power, boy. I mean, she was, <laughs> she was really coming off the wall, you know. I mean, there's there so much spiritual authority there with all these workers that the demons came out of her. She went down the street and took more. About 20 minutes later, she comes back, and there she's her snake again, you know, and sticking her tongue out at us and hissing and all kinds of stuff. 
So one gal came over to me and she said, Jerry, listen. She said, God gave me a word for this lady. She said, I'm going to just get in her face and start praying in the spirit every time she starts manifesting. I said, oh, okay. That's what the Lord told you to do. So here she came again, this gal, you know, and acting really weird. And this little lady wasn't very tall. She was about 98 pounds, I think. She just got right in her face and started praying in the spirit. And boy, just started backing her out of the plaza. This happened about three times and that gal never came back. <laughs> Shut down. The, I don't think the devil liked what was being said there because <laughs> when you pray in the spirit, man, I tell you, there's an authority there that comes and it got rid of the attack. But to my knowledge, the never, lady never got free. So demons are number one. They're what? Territorial. And number two, they leave by Command. It's almost that simple. I don't know that I need to teach a lot more about it. Let's look at some of the deliverances that Jesus revealed through the Word of God. Faith in God's delivering power is important. Faith in God's delivering power is important. We won't quote all these verses because of time. You can read them later. Demons can be delivered from a distance. She begged Jesus to drive out the demons out of her daughter. Wasn't even with her. I believe we have authority, folks. You have a son or a daughter or a child or a neighbor or whatever. Speak it out. I don't know what the limitations of the spirit realm, but I know that God's power can travel. Demons recognize spiritual authority and identity. Now in the synagogue, there was a man who had a spirit of unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice saying, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are. The Holy One of God. By the way, demons. <laughs> in Mitchell, Nebraska, remember the first night I talked about the prostitute that came in? I didn't tell you the beginning of that story. We went to the pastor's office, started dealing with this lady. And the demon starts speaking out to the pastor. And here's what the demon said. I know what you've been doing in this city. To the pastor. Next thing I know, the pastor's on his knees repenting. I never asked what it was. But that demon knew that that pastor had been operating in disobedience in, in an area that he had no authority in. That, I, that kind of spooked me out. I thought, whoa, that's the first time I've seen that. Listen, if you're going to deal with demons, you want to have a clean heart. To the best of your knowledge, make sure you've repented, that you prepared your heart to minister. And Lord, show me any areas of my life. And protect your family. Cover your family. Because when the demons went out of that prostitute, they attacked my children in a nearby hotel. Went right through the room and attacked them. So I learned something. Cover your family with the blood of Christ. I do that every night, by the way. When I put my kids to sleep now, I cover them with the blood of Jesus. I, it's just every night I pray for them when they go to bed. And I lay my hands on them and I say, Father, I just cover these children with the blood of Christ. And I, I assign angels around this bed tonight. And there is no penetration up on these children with any demonic forces. Because when we begin to do work in Haiti, I begin to really come under attack. Our work in Haiti has really been aggressive. We've got four teams down there. We've really spent a lot of time and effort down there. But I'm telling you, Haiti is one of the most demon-infested portions of the earth. You can fly over that country in an airplane, and you know when you're leaving Dominican Republic and coming over Haiti, all the land turns barren. Totally deforested nation. You can't find a tree hardly outside of Port-au-Prince for miles and miles. They've cut them all down. It's just a barren wasteland because that country, when it won independence from France, sacrificed a pig in North Haiti, and, and, and the president of Haiti dedicated Haiti to Satan. And people have been trying to break that curse ever since. That was in 1746, I believe it was. That is one of the toughest nations of the world to deal with. And if you want to have a challenging ministry... You, got, you can cut your teeth on Haiti if you want, but you better make sure your life is right with God when you go down there. Even TBN that built that big hospital ended up losing it to the government. 
Spent millions of dollars. Jan Crouch raised all this money. That was her favorite project, and it never got off the ground. I drove by that beautiful hospital. We went by it going up to, to Forest of the Pines to launch one of our teams, and I saw that beautiful facility. They'd never been able to open it up. Even that got shut down with all the prayer power behind TBN and money behind TBN and everything else. I'm telling you, you're, there are some big strongholds over that nation, and, and there needs to be a widespread repentance in that country to break the strongholds. But it's such a crooked, corrupt country. Every time we got gas, the gas station charged what they want. I went into the manager of the gas station. I said, give us our money back. They didn't, wouldn't give you the change. If you, gave them a, if you bought $5 worth of gas and you gave them 20 they kept it. I said, you know why Haiti is not blessed? I said, because you're so corrupt here. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I just, I hate injustice. You know what I mean? It rips the people off. But I'm just saying there are countries that are oppressed by the devil. But I would like to see just a massive force of prayer and fasting and really aggressive something happen over that country and set it free. I, I would like to see that happen. But it has to happen with the people of Haiti as well because a lot of the church people are corrupt too. And that's what we deal with in our ministry in third world countries some is, is really a, just a corruption that comes through demonic stuff. Pray for us. <laughs> They recognize your spiritual authority. They know who you are. Remember the guys that tried to cast the demons out and they ran out of the house naked and wounded? This is not for the faint of heart or for those that want to play games. But if your life is right with God, don't fear. I don't fear demons. I never fear demons. I just go and do it. Get people set free and practice these principles we're talking about. Some deliverances, by the way, are progressive. If you look at the demonic of the Gadarenes, Jesus had been saying to them, come out, and they still were not coming out. Of course, Jesus is operating under the best spiritual authority that can be on earth, the authority of the Father. Let's read about it. For he commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for it had been, he had been often seized, and he had been kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles, and he broke the bonds and was driven by the demon into the wilderness. And Jesus said to them, What is your name? See, they still hadn't come out, even though he had been commanding them. And he said, Legion, and many, because many demons had entered him. And they begged him that he would not command them to go out into the abyss. Now a herd of swine was feeding near the mountain, and they begged him and that he would permit them to enter them, uh, them and he permitted them. So here, Jesus, it's a, it's a progressive deliverance. There are some people that are under such oppression and stronghold, you've got to persist. But don't back down. The guy got set free. The demons left. So Jesus practiced casting out demons. I wish we had time to go through all the scriptures. Maybe make it a personal journey of yours to just go through the gospel and just record every time there was a deliverance. Demons threw kid, children into the fire. One instance, a child into the fire. And, and, you know, so demons have influence over people. By the way, when people are demon-possessed, somebody has given a legal right for the demon to be there. I was up in uh, Spring Hill. I, just, I, was, I spent a year in Florida in 1991 before we moved out here later. In 91, I was in Florida for a year, and I was at a church up in uh, Spring Hill, and I preached in this church, and a witch came to the service. She, she was a third-generation witch. Her mother was, had been a witch, and her grandmother had been a witch. By the way, there's a lot of witchcraft up north of town up here, about Moon Lake and that area. And so her husband told her, if you don't get, get to church and get your life straightened out with God, I'm leaving you. So he'd kind of put an ultimatum to her. She had drawn blood every adult day of her life and offered it to Satan on an altar in her home. This was a regular ritual of hers. And uh, at the end of the service, she came forward. Well, there was one deacon in this church. He was a big guy. He was really big. And I saw him at the altar, and they were trying to deal with this lady and trying to get the demons out of her. So they came to me, and they said, Jerry, we, we, we're not having too much success because they were not practicing the principles that we had learned here. I hadn't taught that yet to that church. So I went up there and I started dealing with her. And so I, I uh, start walking up to this woman and the demon starts speaking out of her. We don't want you here. I just moved to, to Florida. We don't want you here. Go back. 
Go back. They didn't like me moving to Florida. <laughs> you know, demons know when their territory is invaded by somebody that knows how to deal with them. They get upset. They're territorial. When they've owned an area of the country and they get some spirit-filled believers in there that know how to deal with them and confront them, trust me, they don't like it. Anyway, the lady got set free, and I mean to tell you, God really, really blessed that lady. She got into the Bible study there. They had a motor home, and she started going around to our outreaches with her husband, and she, she was in 24-hour worship. She told me, she said, Jerry, this was months later, she said, Jerry, I cannot maintain myself without staying in constant worship. She said, I play worship and praise tapes 24 hours a day, even during the night in my home. And she says, that is the only thing I have found that keeps me in total peace with God. So that's, maybe it says something right there. Third, Jesus healed the sick. And we've got to finish this up quickly. We have a few minutes. Healing is in the atonement. Not only did Jesus give the disciples authority to heal the sick prior to the dying on the cross, but he further sealed the promise through his blood. That's his crucifixion. Healing has always been God's promise. Even in the Old Testament, God gave the promise to Israel. I am the God who heals you, Exodus 15, 26. Let's look at some of the great healing miracles of the master healer himself. I love the story of the woman with the issue of blood. She had suffered 12 years. Her condition was desperate. She had spent all on physicians and had only gotten worse. She knew that pressing into Jesus was a presence, and Jesus' presence was the answer. And this woman was determined to be healed. Thus, we see one of the great principles of healing Pressing into the presence of God. Pressing into the presence of God. Nobody does this better than Benny Hinn on a mass level through worship. Just get God's presence flowing. People get healed. It's what we do on the streets. You'll see it next Saturday. She said, if I can just get into the presence of Jesus and touch the hem of his garment... I will be healed. I like this woman. Her declaration of faith in her heart prepared her as well. So the second is faith through confession becomes possession. She confessed it. Even before she got to Jesus, she said, If I can just touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. She's already confessing her healing before she got there. We were down at uh, the Hilton here in Tampa, and it's one of the great healings that God has brought allowed us to experience. We were doing a night of healing down at the Hilton. This was about four years ago now. And Renee came to the, to the uh, service. Renee was three months away from dying. Her liver count, she had hepatitis C, her liver count was 420. The doctor said, if you live six months, it'll be a miracle, but we give you three. She was up for some kind of a liver transplant, but d didn't have the money. and dying of hepatitis C. But she said, you know what? She spent a whole day in prayer with a friend, and she said, I knew that that night I was going to be healed. So she came to our healing service and, and already prepared her heart. She was ready. She had prayed. And she's traveled around with us. She was at the theater, remember, out there? She takes her doctor's report. I like that when you got doctor's reports. Don't you like that? Total verification. 420 blood count on her liver. Last stages of hepatitis C. 30. Totally healed. Total brand new liver. Uh, the doctors at Tampa Bay General say it's the only case they've ever seen of a total reversal of hepatitis C without any medication and without any operation. To God be the glory. Amen. Doctors reports. I like this stuff. And she gives her testimony all over. The th third, her action of faith. She did something about it. She not only declared it, she said, I can receive it. Let's go to the top of 34. I love Bartimaeus. Now we get into the style that God has taught us for healing. And I'm going to show you why people don't get healed when you pray and why they do get healed when you pray. And this, this training is so valuable, folks. I'm telling you. We would watch these videos on the streets of San Francisco and week after week we weren't seeing healings. And then God began to instruct us how to change what we were doing because what we were doing was actually shutting off the healing instead of bringing it. 
Bartimaeus stands before Jesus. We won't read all the scripture, but let's just summarize it in this. Bartimaeus stands before Jesus who asks him, what would you have me to do? Is that an interesting question? Is it evident what he needed? I mean, this guy's been sitting at the gate out there for years. Everybody probably in the city knows him. He's blind. Isn't it pretty evident what he needs? What does he need? His sight. Why in the world does Jesus ask him this question? Doesn't Jesus know what he needs? This is very interesting. Jesus wants Bartimaeus to confess his need. It's only through confessing your need that you focus your faith. I was in Romania. We were in a theater doing a healing service up north of uh, near Brashov, a place called Brashov. And we rented this theater, and, and uh, these people had never experienced anything like this. So this man got in line to get healed, and he came forward first, and he said, I said, what, what, would you, what do you want Jesus to do? Now watch how I use these words. What do you want Jesus to do for you? Are you with me? Say it with me. What do you want Jesus to do for you? What am I doing? The key to healing, I'm going to make it real simple in the next five minutes. The key to all healing is two things. Number one, focusing their faith on the source and focusing their faith on the need. Faith is important in healing. You've probably heard of the term faith healers. Faith is important in healing. Almost every story of healing in the New Testament, Jesus honored their faith. He said to the woman who was healed of the issue of blood, Your faith has made you whole. He said the same thing to Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus wasn't going to shut up. He got louder when the disciples said, Just be quiet. He said, No, this is my chance. Jesus is coming by my way. Here's what I do when I have people pray for the sick. And I want you to do this next Saturday when you, when you minister down there. And I want, want you to do it in our church here if, if you, from now on because you're going to see results. Here's normally what people say, and this is why they don't see healing. I'm going to tell you what not to say first. Never, never say this. How can I pray for you? That is the worst thing you can ever say when you're coming to healing. Because now what's the focus? Your prayer. So people are looking to what for their healing? Your prayer. I never say that. We've done lots of healings now over these 20 some years and it works, it works. Here's what I tell people. What do you want Jesus to do for you? Number one. Number two, do you believe? Do you believe that he can heal you? If they say no, then I do some additional instruction. I build their faith. Do you believe that Jesus can heal you? Yes, I believe. I came today expecting. I, his, his word says he will heal me. Boy, they're ready. What do you want Jesus to do? Well, it's my back. I was injured in a car accident three years ago, and I, I'm in constant pain. Okay, take your left hand and put it on your back. Now raise your right hand to Jesus. All right? Now I want to remind you, I cannot heal you. Nobody in this room can heal you. We don't have that power. But we'll connect you to the one that does. Who is going to heal you today? Jesus. Jesus. Constantly focus their faith on the healer, not you. Now you have them pray this prayer. Jesus. I receive my healing now. I am healed. Man, we've seen results with that. When we started practicing that approach, and it's biblical, I just never understood it. I was telling people, how can I pray for you today? Nothing had happened. Healing has to do with faith. Jesus is the source. They lowered the man through the roof. 
to bring him to Jesus. Got to get into the presence of the Lord. That's where the faith works. Jesus said to Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do <laughs> for you? Oh, that I might receive my sight. Now, he's focusing his faith, right? He's focusing his need to the source. Did that help at all? Yes. Try this out, folks. I mean, just try it with the next person you pray for in here. Let's practice it a minute. What do you want Jesus to do for you? Number two, do you believe that he has the power to heal you? Maybe even quote a verse. Build their faith. Build it to the real source. Put your hand. I always use the physical approach because it, it really helps people focus. Put it on their stomach, their heart, their head, whatever it is. Focus it. Raise the other hand to Jesus. And now I'm going to agree with you. If to what? Agree? On earth as touching these things, they shall be done to my Father which is in heaven. Boy, that works. We've had some awesome healings on the streets. Healings are often associated with demons and spirits of infirmities. So sometimes you've got to do a combination of deliverance and healing. By the way, one of the keys for people to release their faith is they must, number one, forgive others. Do you know how much unforgiveness blocks healing? In fact, a lot of sickness is caused by unforgiveness and bitterness. Bitterness becomes a root in our life, okay? Okay. We're almost finished with this section. Is that okay? Can we just finish up real fast? Healing was done by Jesus and his disciples with two means, a laying on of hands and anointing with oil. I believe in oil. We've got, I found another box of it in our stuff. I didn't realize we had it. Try to get one of those anointed oils for, for I mean, these are scented oils from Israel. I love them. And different oils represent different things. The pomegranate oil represents fruitfulness, uh, you know, there's, there's different oils over there. Check them out. And I just love using oil because Jesus used it. It's a point, I believe, of faith and contact. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Mark 6.13, top of page 35. No healing was lar too large or small. Peter's mother-in-law was healed of the fever, right? Some additional principles we found in Praying for the sick are make sure people have forgiven those who have offended them. And number two, make sure they have all known sin out of their life. Now, I want to make a statement here. I want you to remember this. Fill them with the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, look at this. When the word of God becomes more real than your disease, your faith is prepared to receive. Did you get that? When the Word of God is more real than your sickness, you're ready for healing. I love that phrase. That's a good one. Somebody gave that to me. It's not mine. <laughs> but I love it. When the Word of God is more powerful than your sickness, you're ready for healing. All right. We declare the following. Want to stand and stretch just a minute and make these declarations in this section? Let's do it. Come on. Let's stand up and make these declarations. Get ready to receive. All right. I just do that at the end of this section because it's so important. Let's all repeat it together. Let's read it together. I receive and come under the same authority and anointing that Jesus walked in. I am empowered to do the will of God, perform the works of God, and speak the word of God. Therefore, I commit to declare the kingdom of God with power to heal the sick and to cast out demons. I can do this because God's word says so. Amen. Amen. I commit to hear the voice of God by developing intimacy with God and learning to obey His commands. In doing so, I believe I will develop this ability to clearly discern the voice of the Holy Spirit inside of me. I commit to practice the immediate action of faith by doing what God commands without any resistance on my part. I take this risk because I trust His voice in me. I commit to take the territory God has given me that has placed, he has placed in my area of earthly dominion. 
I will walk in the power of the kingdom of God with authority, not fearing the enemy. I commit to awaken each day with a fresh awareness of how God will use me to win others to Christ. I will be keen to discern his leading throughout the day. Amen. Come on. Let's give the Lord a hand. Hallelujah. Woo. Hallelujah. All right. Take a break. We'll be back.